This Saturday, Argentina commemorates the 40th anniversary of the Malvinas War. President Alberto Fernandez headed the commemorative ceremony. And in Brazil, at least nine people died in the midst of heavy storms affecting the state of Rio de Janeiro. The Israeli regime escalated its violence against the Palestinian people. The occupying army assassinated three young Palestinian men in the occupied West Bank. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Treasure Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Argentina, the official commemorative acts of the 40th anniversary of the Malvinas War are held. The ceremonies began with the unveiling of the work in tribute to the fallen in the Malvinas by the plastic artist Perez Esquivel at the Casa Rosada, with the presence of President Alberto Fernandez. After this, the main act took place at the Malvinas Museum and was headed by the president. He was accompanied by former presidents Evo Morales of Bolivia, Fernando Lugo of Paraguay, and Jose Mujica of Uruguay. President Fernandez denounced that the decision to invade the islands was an irresponsible one and maintained his country's claim to the territory. We Argentinian men and women share the same conviction. The Malvinas Islands are part of our national territory. The Malvinas have always been Argentinian and we will never give in to our claims. I will say that in this last week we also remember, first, on March 24th, on the occasion of the Day of Memory, Truth and Justice, and then also, I also saw my dear friend Lorenzo Pepe over there, we remembered the 40th anniversary of the historic march under the slogan, Peace, Bread and Work called by the workers' movement on March 30th, 1982. A Peruvian government delegation began talks with the sectors on strike in the city of Huancayo this Saturday. As part of a negotiation agenda proposed by President Pedro Castillo, the Minister of Foreign Trade, Roberto Sanchez, leads the delegation that has been holding meetings with local leaders since Saturday morning to listen to their demands and advance alternatives to put an end to the conflict. The Foreign Minister highlighted the willingness of the national government to dialogue and emphasize that they are willing to negotiate an agreement instead of trying to impose a unilateral formula. For his part, the Minister of Culture, Alejandro Salas, informed that the President of the Council of Ministers, Aníbal Torres, will arrive in the city in the next hours to be part of the talks. The government of Peru also announced that it will abide by any decision of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on whether former President Alberto Fujimori should remain in prison despite a court ruling allowing his release. Peruvian prosecutor Carlos Miguel Reaño pointed out that the Peruvian state recognizes the rights of victims whose human rights were affected during Alberto Fujimori's administration. Meanwhile, he affirmed that the decision of the Human Rights Court will be implemented by the state in the most expeditious manner possible. The human rights entity ratified on Friday the request to the Peruvian justice system not to release former President Fujimori from prison until the court resolved the provisional measures requested by the victims of the various Altos and La Cantuta massacres. In Honduras, the corruption court rejected the amnesty request for one of the accused of organizing the murder of environmentalist Berta Cáceres. Through a publication on Twitter, the judiciary declared that the amnesty decree requested by the defenses of Roberto David Castillo and Roberto Martinez Lozano, accused in the Agua Sarca case, would not be granted. Likewise, the court concluded that the defense did not show evidence that the defendants were victims or opposed the 2009 coup that overthrew the President Manuel Zelaya, so the amnesty law does not apply. The Civic Council of Popular and Indigenous Organizations of Honduras, one of the entities demanding justice for the murder of the environmentalist, described the court's rejections as a triumph for the Lenca people, the indigenous community, and the farmers' organizations seeking justice. In El Salvador, the judiciary removed a specialized judge from his office after being questioned by the Republic's president, Nayib Bukele. A Supreme Court memorandum confirmed the decision to transfer the judge of the Specialized Sentencing Court A of San Salvador, Godofredo Salazar, to the First Instance Court of Ilobasco Cabañas, where he will begin his duties on April 4th. 
This comes after the specialized judge gave his decision last March 31st in a trial where 42 gang members of Panchimalco's neighborhood 18 were acquitted for lack of evidence, a fact that was described by Bukele as an attempt to free the gang members, those accusing the judge of being an accomplice of organized crime. The judge based his decision on the fact that the witness presented by the public prosecutor's office was inconsistent, imprecise, and ambiguous. This is the fourth case of transfer of an independent judge in recent months. In Panama, the Secretary General of the National Union of Workers in the Construction and Similar Industry, Suntrax, Saulo Mendes, announced this Friday the decision to go on strike on April 4th to demand a salary adjustment. The union leader explained in a press conference that the Panamanian Chamber of Construction is determined not to yield in its positions against this working class. He affirmed that as a pressure measure, they will carry out a strike demanding a fair salary to cover basic needs and the high cost of food, medicines, electricity, and fuel. Union members have also proposed an annual wage increase of 0 0.67 cents an hour over the next four years. However, the employers consider that the, so far they can only guarantee payments for workers with 0.10 percent an hour over the same period, a setback that is still being questioned by Suntrax. Costa Ricans will vote in a second and final round of presidential elections on Sunday with many voters hoping for strong hands to lift their country out of the economic crisis. Voters of the Caribbean country are trying to pick a leader between their former president from the 1990s and a former World Bank economist. The country's next president will have a monumental task on his hands, with foreign debt totaling more than two-thirds of the country's GDP, worsening poverty rates and high unemployment. With opinion polls quite evenly split between the two candidates, the battle over money might turn out to be the winner hand that moves Costa Rican's voters at the ballot box this Sunday. We are taking a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In Brazil, heavy rains since Thursday night killed at least nine people. Neighbors of the coastal community of Ponta Negra reported that at least one person died in the town of Mesquita, while seven others were found dead after a landslide in Parati. The ninth victim recorded was a shower in Angra dos Reis, in the south of Rio de Janeiro state. Authorities detail that in the last 48 hours, 655 millimeters of rain have been registered in the continental region and 592 millimeters in Ilha Grande. So far, there are 11 people missing. And a historic and unprecedented victory has been achieved by workers at an Amazon facility in New York, the global city of the United States, who succeeded in defeating the giant corporation and will create the first trade union. Voting at the New York and Staten Island facility began on Thursday, with a majority of 2,654 votes in favor and 2,131 votes against the right to vote. After months of struggle, the nearly 6,000 employees have taken the lead over other employees in the country who have also risen up against Amazon's management to demand better working conditions. Since the very beginning, the company has been opposed to the organization of its workers in trade unions, even going so far as to promote campaign against this right recognized in federal and international law. Christian Smalls, leader of the new trade union, said in the midst of a great celebration that what they had achieved was the beginning of a great revolution. Amazon tried to make it about me from day one. And I never said it was going to be Amazon versus Chris Smalls. It's always going to be Amazon versus the people. And today the people have spoken and the people wanted a union. This is going to be the, the, the catalyst for the revolution. That's exactly what this is. Y'all just witnessed that. That's all I can say about it. This is the, cat the catalyst for the revolution. Uh, just like Starbucks. Y'all see what's going on with the Starbucks unionizing across the country. We expect the same outcome. We already got interest in uh, 18 different buildings in uh, several different states. Workers reaching out to us. We want to help every single person we could.
Rocha demanded that the Secretariat of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, immediately terminate its presence in Ukraine. The, po the spokeswoman of the Russian Foreign Ministry, Maria Zakharova, said that it is unacceptable that there is a frequent repetition of cases when the OSCE property, such as field armor vehicles, consistently falls into the hands of Ukrainian armed units. Moscow demanded that the OSCE immediately implement measures for the closure of the special monitoring mission because the mission can no longer continue with the previous mandate, which was extended to the territory of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, recognized by Russia as independent states. The official recalled that the organization did not make a single statement in the face of growing aggressive Russophobic nationalism. From the self proclaimed People's Republic of Donetsk, where war can be heard and felt, our special envoy to Ukraine, Alejandro Kirk, brings more information. What becomes apparent just crossing the border between Russia and the People's Republic of Donetsk is that here you live the situation of war. The military is all over the place. You see tanks, you see uh, personal um, armored carriers, you see cannons, and you hear the roar of cannons somewhere um, at, at a medium distance from here. Uh, the option of not, of not winning this war is not there uh, on the table. Um, people are determined to win this war because they feel here as much as in Russia, but probably more evident here that uh, their very existence is at stake. That uh, is what uh, the message we got just now from uh, Alexander Borodai, the first prime minister of Donetsk and a hero of this republic and now a deputy to the Russian Duma. Look, the future of Donbass is absolutely certain for me and I have been talking about it for eight years since 2014. Donbass is going to Russia and in fact it has already become part of Russia. I personally believe that already there should be no Ukrainian state. This state is first of all a terrorist state and secondly a Nazi state. I want to remind you that Nazism is not only hating the Jews, hating the Russians and deciding to destroy the Russians as a people. That is also Nazism. I want to tell you that the United States itself has not realized what they have done and what a trap they have walked into. Indeed, they were dictators, world leaders, economic leaders, but now their role in the world is crumbling. The role of the dollar as a world reserve currency no longer exists, and we have to understand that and the emergency of the other reserve currencies and other reserve currency powerful enough to compete with the dollar is not far off. Alexander Borodai, the first prime minister of Donetsk, speaking exclusively to Telesur. Russia warned the UK government that British long-range artillery cannons and anti-ship systems will become legitimate targets for its armed forces if they arrive to Ukraine. The Kremlin's message was reiterated by Andrei Kalin, Moscow's ambassador to London, explaining that any delivery of weapons is destabilizing, especially those described by the British Defense Secretary, Ben Wallace. The diplomat assured that these actions increase tensions and aggravate the lethality of the confrontation, since they are weapons of great precision, which would be a legitimate target for the Russian armed forces. Kalin said he was concerned about London's perception of the conflict, assuring that they assess the situation on the basis of the reports of the Defense Secretary and the Kiev leadership, and that is why they still believe that Azov Battalion is about to liberate Mariupol. The president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, has once again criticized Europe for its stupidity in the face of what he called the humanitarian catastrophe in Mariupol, referring to the city located in the south of the country where heavy fighting has taken place. In his customary video conferences, at the end or beginning of the day, Zelensky assured that through a humanitarian corridor they managed to get more than 3,000 people out of the city. According to his report, more than 160,000 are still trying to survive there. Hours before his message, the president requested through his Twitter account the intervention of the French counterpart Emmanuel Macron to request Moscow to facilitate the humanitarian work in Mariupol. Throughout the week, the government of Donetsk has sent eight brigades food, medicine, and clothing to the city. However, on Friday, a team from the International Red Cross Committee said that the conditions in the area made it impossible to continue for the team of three vehicles and nine members of the organization. The Chinese director of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
of European Affairs Department, Wang Lutong, said Saturday at a press briefing in Beijing that the relations between the European Union and China are still focused on dialogue and cooperation. The Chinese official also asserted that China opposes sanctions and that the key solution of the conflict is in the hands of Washington, Brussels, and Moscow. The press briefing came one day after Chinese President Xi Jinping met via video link Friday with European Council President Charles Michel and European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen when he had called on the European Union to work with China to promote the steady and sustained growth of their relations and add stabilizing factors to a turbulent world. Actually, we are not doing anything deliberately to <coughs> circum circumvent the sanctions imposed on Russia by uh, Americans and uh, Europeans. Um, you know our position on the issue of sanctions. We oppose sanctions. And the effects of these sanctions also risks spilling to the rest of the world, leading to wars of currency, wars of trade, and wars of finance, and also risks jeopardizing and the supply chain and the industrial chain and the globalization and even the economic order established since the Second World War. China is not a related party on the, the crisis of Ukraine and we don't think our normal trade with any other country should be affected. We have more news coming up after the final short break so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Israel escalated its violence against the Palestinian people. This Saturday, the occupying army assassinated three young Palestinian men in the occupied West Bank, accusing them of being part of terrorist organizations. The Palestinian youth were traveling in a vehicle that was fired upon by Israeli counterterrorism forces. Tensions on both sides of the strip have risen, especially in recent hours, on the eve of the holy month of Ramadan. Israel has experienced a series of terrorist attacks through several have been claimed by Daesh. The occupying authority insists on blaming Palestinian insurgent groups. The Israeli police claim that the three young men executed extrajudicially this Saturday were part of the Islamic Jihad. The Palestinian media have reported that the three bodies were kidnapped after the murder. Iran and China proved once again this Friday that they continue to strengthen their bilateral relations, focusing on cooperation in the fight against unitarianism and sanctions. Hossein Amir Abdullahian, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iran, thanked China for hosting the third summit of foreign ministers of Afghanistan's neighboring countries, where both sides exchanged different points of view on bilateral issues. Other top diplomats from Russia, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan also participated in the event. The Persian, the Persian Foreign Affairs Minister stressed in his remarks that sanctions are used by Western countries to pressure and constrain independent nations. Yemen's acting human rights minister Ali al-Dailami claimed that the United Nations Children's Fund and other organizations reportedly working with children are seeking to cover up crimes committed by the so-called coalition led by Saudi Arabia. The government of Yemen called the attention of UNICEF and the United Nations affirmed that they will no longer accept solutions and measures from them after ratifying that these organizations only show enthusiasm and support at donor conferences where they use figures and statistics about the country's situation but then disappear at the conclusion of the events. The Arab Kingdom and its allies with the United States support continued organ organizing conflicts against the Yemeni people and therefore reiterate the criticism towards UN considering that there is complicity with their aggressors. The M23 rural movement in the Democratic Republic of the Congo is seeking a peaceful settlement after clashes with the army earlier this week in the east of the country. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres is alarmed by the resurgence of the M23 rural group in the DRC. His spokesman said without directly blaming these fighters for the crash of a UN helicopter that killed eight people. Six Pakistanis, a Russian and a Serb died when a Puma helicopter with the UN mission MONUSCO crashed while on reconnaissance over the troubled Chansu area of Futshuru territory where the army and the M23 rebels fought. 
The M23 is same derived from March 23 movement emerged years ago from an ethnic Tutsi Congolese rebellion in North Kivu that was once supported by Rwanda and Uganda. It remains faithful to its political line, which is that of a peaceful settlement of the crisis between it and the government of the Republic. The Congolese Revolutionary Army reserves the right to retaliate vigorously in the event of a new war initiative by the National Army or its auxiliaries. A fire destroyed the main market in Hargeisa, capital of the autonomous region of Somaliland. The cause of the blaze that gutted the sprawling Wahin market, the lifeblood of the city and home to an estimated 2,000 shops and stalls, is not yet known and also injured about two dozen people. Local authorities said the fire started on Friday evening but was largely brought under control by dawn on Saturday, although some small areas were still burning. Fire engulfed our business unexpectedly. We were not ready. We saw the fire as we were busy in working. Then we fled to survive. We lost about $200,000 in this fire tragedy. And uh, I request everybody who can help us uh, from anywhere. Uh, we, 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 we need your help and Somaliland and I want to appreciate everyone who uh, participated in this disaster to help. Uh, fire brigades, uh, national armies, uh, new, um, um, media, and the people of so and Hargeisa and Somaliland. We have come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.